Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audio Books, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Education, SOE, Master's Degree Programs, Master of Arts, Distance Education, MADE, First Year, Second Year. MD 419 Staff Training and Development in Distance Education. Block 1 Growth and Development. Unit 1, Amorphous Beginning. 1.0 Introduction. You are aware that distance education in its various forms has been in practice for many years now. But the idea of staff development or training in the area of distance education is of a recent origin. The earliest attempts in this area are associated with the beginning of the Open University, U.K. During the early 1970s, and later at the Indira Gandhi National Open University, India, in 1987, it should be of great interest to all of us to study the various schools of thought, and the corresponding practices and areas of emphasis that may have emerged during this short span of about three decades. We should state, at the very outset, that our focus is on the advanced levels of training for distance educators, i.e., any training in this area available for Lower levels has not been considered for our discussion here. 1.1 Objectives In this unit, we shall first present a brief outline of the trends in staff. Development for distance education during the 1970s. In the main, we shall present six cases of differing characters. It is quite instructive and interesting to study these cases for their variety and divergence in approaches. The Purpose is to drive home the point that staff development programs differ according to the needs of the institutions which conduct the training programs. At the end of this unit, you will be able to list and comment on the main features of the course team approach at the Open University, U.K. The training of educational technologists at the Jordan Hill College of Education, U.K. Special staff training courses, meant, for developing countries, at the International Extension College and the University of London, U.K. The Common Training Programme for Educators at the University of Surrey, U.K., and The Course in Distance Education given by the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, India. 1.2 The Course Team Approach it is interesting to note that the Open University, U.K., during its formative years did not recognize the need for systematic training for distance educators. They believed that the skills, knowledge and attitudes which go into the making of a distance educator can best be learnt on the job, and whatever additional skills need to be learnt, can be picked up from manuals. 1.2.1 Philosophy of Staff Development for Distance Education at OUK The philosophy of staff development for distance education at the OUK was mainly based on two assumptions, i, that distance educators must learn their skills on the job, and 2, that of all the tasks which make the process of distance education, the one that needs training is the task of course development. This philosophy is understandable as far as this open university is concerned. Being the pioneers in the field of large-scale open distance education, they had no models to go by, they had to develop their own models and for all practical purposes their own training models have stood them in good stead. 1.2.2 Teaching Materials, Credibility and Quality Questions The first problem that the open university faced was with that of credibility. The academia in particular and the public in general were skeptical about the success of the university. The university authorities took no time to realize that the main tool to fight the skepticism and establish their credibility was the quality of their teaching materials. The quality of education being imparted by the university could be judged both by the academics and the students, in terms of the quality of these materials. To operationalize this realization, a machinery had to be set up to produce high-quality materials, and this machinery came to be known as the course team. 1.2.3 A case for developing a course team besides the assumptions mentioned above, 1.2.1, 1 
the course team approach originated also from the belief that it was not advisable to leave the content, presentation and teaching of the open university courses to the idiosyncrasies of individual teachers as is the case with face-to-face -face teaching. Nor could it be left to the whims of individual departments or schools within the university. There were two more reasons for course teams to come into being, i, interdisciplinary courses, which the university had decided to produce and give, could not be produced by individual academics or departments, there had to be some kind of cooperation among different departments and individuals from different disciplines. 2. If the multimedia approach was to be a success, the media experts had to cooperate and work with the academics a course produced by this method, claims Lord Perry. 1976, will inevitably tend to be superior in quality to any course produced by an individual. This method has been adopted, with various degrees of modification, by open universities in many countries Canada, Australia, Asia, and South America. Lord Perry, 1976, rightly claims that the concept of the course team is the single most important contribution of the open university to teaching practice. 1.2 Four constituents and responsibilities of the course team A course team consists of a number of subject experts, an educational technologist, an editor, a BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, producer, a course administrator and a staff tutors, a person who looks after the tutorial service in a region of the country. One of the academics I. E. The subject specialist, is chosen by the team as chairperson of the course team. He or she conducts all the meetings of the course team. It is the academics in the team who have the joint responsibility for planning and developing the course. The non-academic members of the team work in collaboration with the academics but remain answerable to their parent departments. For example, the BBC producer, who functions as a member of the course team is ultimately answerable to the BBC. Besides the members of the course team, there are many more experts and skilled personnel whose contributions are vital to the production of high-quality materials. These are graphic experts, project control staff, librarians, etc. It should be clear that the UUK regards the course team as the training ground for distance educators. Working as a member of the team is considered actual training. We need to know more about this training ground and the training. 1.2.5 Course Team Operations All the course teams do not work the same way. In certain cases, the draft units are prepared by individuals and later are discussed by the whole team. The modifications and suggestions which come up during these discussions are incorporated in the text. The materials are then passed on to the materials production centers. Thus, though the basic work may have been done by an individual, the entire team is supposed to have produced the course. In other cases, the members of the team produce the draft units and circulate them among other members for comments. On the basis of the comments received the unit writers revise the units. In such revisions, they may or may not take into account all the comments they receive. The ultimate responsibility for the quality of the units, however is that of the writer himself slash herself. 1.2.6 Problems of the course team approach Functioning in a course team may not always be a smooth going affair. Some of the reasons for these are as follows, i, difficulty in getting the right kind of academics, to function successfully in a course team, an academic needs to have at least the following five attributes, a, subject expertise b, writing skills c, teaching skills, d, time consciousness, and e, cost consciousness. It is not always possible to find academics with all these attributes. There are academics who cannot write well for the learner's purposes, others who find it impossible to work to deadlines and a few others who are not cost conscious. There are reported cases which show how, with the approach of deadlines, members find it difficult to read and comment on their teammates' work. Unit drafts receive scant attention and, in many cases, even the meetings are not attended. With the result that in certain cases, only the course team chairperson remains to steer the course to the deadlines. In other cases, a distaste for criticism compels some academics to submit their unit drafts late in order to save themselves from the criticism of their colleagues, some of whom can be junior colleagues. In still worse situations a course team member who finds himself slash herself criticized repeatedly and unnecessarily, from his slash her point of view, may withdraw from the team forever. Besides, there may be situations when, 
to reach consensus in the team becomes impossible or takes an unusually long time. 2. Clash of Egos It is not unusual for senior academics of a faculty to work as members of course teams which are chaired by junior members of staff, which is not a pleasant experience in all the cases, and is definitely counterproductive in certain cases. Lord Perry, 1976, however, was of the considered view that relative seniority of staff members was of no consequence as far as the chairpersonship was concerned. Chairpersons, he felt should be appointed for their skills in management. But, it is not as though academics with qualifications or skills in management are easily available. Thus, the work getting messed up under an unskilled chairperson may not be an unusual occurrence. However, ways and means should be found from time to time to overcome such difficulties. 3. Problems in integrating specializations One of the obvious objectives of the course team is to effect integration across various specializations which the teams bring together. However, it is not possible to achieve this objective completely. In the first place some specializations are so different from the training and experience of the team members that they cannot even think of taking up work roles under those specializations. For example, a professor in chemistry may find it difficult to see eye to eye with a video producer. Secondly, it is not unusual for specialists of various types to guard their specialization to the extent of not allowing others in the team even to think of contributing within those specializations. 1.2.7 Learning from the experience of a course team We can gain significant insights from the experience of course team approaches practiced at the UUK. Some of them are given below. 1. Excellent materials. Despite what we have described and discussed above, the UUK has produced teaching slash learning materials which are acclaimed all over the world in spite of bitter experiences of some academics, attacks on their intellectual activity and integrity, their Disgust and indifference, the material, produced are worthy of the effort. After all, course teams need not be a bad experience only. It should always be possible to find a few people in course teams who bear the brunt of preparing the courses. These are the people whose personal qualities suit this kind of work environment. They may find the course team a suitable situation in which they can exploit their qualities to the maximum. 2. Good, but selective training, though one cannot deny the fact that course teams produce high-quality materials, the very course teams cannot be considered training grounds for distance educators. At best, they are training grounds only selectively, i.e., only a few people who by virtue of their personal qualities or influences of education, fit into the system of course teams and the course team culture. Only these may actually get trained in such teams. Besides, such training shall take a long time for completion. 3. Expensive and time-consuming Even those who succeed as the members of course teams, and thus become trained distance educators, do so very slowly and at a very high cost. It is a widely accepted fact that materials produced by the course team approach are very expensive that producing distance educators through this approach must be expensive too is no exaggeration. 4. Writing courses alone will not make us distance educators, training on the job, as a member of a course team, does not impart all the skills and the knowledge required by a distance educator, or a person engaged in distance education. Distance education is much more than the Preparation and Development of Teaching Slash Learning Materials 1.3 Training Educational Technologists Here, we shall discuss a training course which though relevant to the practice of distance education, did not originate as a course on distance education, or if it did, it could not be comprehensive, as distance education was not thought to be a discipline those days. In fact, as you know the term, Distance education was recognized officially in 1982, at the 12th World Conference of the International Council for Correspondence Education. Since called International Council for Distance Education, at Vancouver, Canada, the course we are referring to was introduced in 1975, and is called 
the CNA Postgraduate Diploma in Educational Technology given by Jordan Hill College of Education, JCE, Glasgow, UK, CNA is in Abbreviation for Council for National Academic Awards The course was started in response to demands from all levels of education in Scotland and the other parts of the UK for trained staff, often referred to as educational technologists, who combine skills of instructional design, skill of resource organisation and experience in the production of learning materials. Components of the course The course comprises three broad categories described briefly as follows. 1. Theoretical studies, i.e., concepts of educational technology, towards science of learning and communication, curriculum study and the systems approach to, management studies, i.e., management of staff, production facilities, copyright and contract etc. 3. Production skills, i.e., graphics, printing, tape recording, TV production, computer-assisted learning etc. 1.4 Training Distance Educators for Developing Countries A four-month course on distance teaching given by the International Extension College, IEC, and the Department of International and Comparative Education of the University of London, Institute of Education, London, was introduced in its earliest form in 1977. Target groups The course is meant for the developing countries and caters to the needs of those who are currently working or intend to work in distance education institutions such as open universities, directorates slash units of correspondence courses and agricultural or health extension services. Objectives The objectives of the course are to enable the students to determine whether or not distance teaching is appropriate to their countries, to make informed choices between different methods of distance teaching, to work out administrative arrangements for distance teaching, and to write, edit, revise and maintain distance teaching materials. Course content The course content includes themes like characteristics of distance education, print, broadcasting, and face-to-face -face tuition, integrated courses for effective learning, course design and editing, organization and management of distance teaching materials. The overall emphasis is on practical work rather than theory. Thus, the academic work is divided into various activities, 1, 3 intensive workshops on, a, planning and administration, b, planning, writing and producing printed materials, c, writing and producing radio programs. 2. Individual written projects on themes, pertaining to distance education, of the trainees' choice. 3. Case studies to be presented, seminars to be participated and studies of distance teaching institutes in the UK. Are the programs discussed in 1.3 and 1.4 adequate to train distance educators? Evidently, either of the above courses, the one given by the Jordan Hill College and the other by International Extension College, is relevant to the needs of a distance educator. However, they do not point to professionalism. In distance education, the CNAA diploma has been conceived as a course in educational technology and is supposed to be useful for teachers working at all the levels of instruction, preschool to the higher university levels of education. The second course we talked about is a course in distance. Teaching both in content and intent, however, its character remains that of an extended workshop. Besides, a four-month course cannot go beyond the purposes of orientation, as it does not give any idea of the entirety of distance education as a discipline or profession. We shall discuss this issue more elaborately in the following section. 1.5 Training Educators from Developing Countries The Institute of Educational Development, University of Surrey, U.K., introduced a diploma program in the practice of higher education in October 1980, given through the distance mode. It was later developed to an M.Sc. program. The program was meant for teachers of higher education from developing countries. It may appear odd to bring in such a course for discussion here, as our focus is distance education rather than higher education. But this difference in the key expression should not mislead us, as the theoretical basis of the program of this nature has a significant contribution to make in our discussions. 1.5.1 A Common Training Program Elton, 1981, 
believes that education at the distance and education not at a distance, i.e., traditional face-to-face -face teaching, should not be thought of as wholly separate forms of education. He contends that the teachers in distance education should not be trained separately and differently from those who teach in face-to-face -face situations. In other words, they should be trained together through the same course, as both teachers and students may be involved in both forms at the same time or in the same program. The following points need to be considered for furthering our discussion. 1. Elton, 1981, does not recommend training distance educators as distance educators, instead, he recommends that teachers in general require a knowledge of educational principles and their application to practice which goes far beyond matters which differ between on-campus and off-campus teaching. If teachers are to teach effectively in situations which are not wholly traditional, they have to be trained in the fundamentals of their profession. In other words Elton's distance educator does not require any training different from that needed by an educator. By implication, it would appear, a training course for an educator has enough in its contents and intend to cover the elements which are required by distance educators that is, the elements which differentiate distance education from education in general. But, Elton does not seem to contribute to this view either. He thinks that the prospective distance educator needs the much required orientation to the demands of his slash he new tasks. He admits that distance education poses problems which do not arise in face-to-face -face teaching, and also that those academics who join distance education institutions seem to require some training. He also admits that experienced university teachers have not always shown good results when asked to work in distance teaching institutions. Very often their efforts have not gone beyond their producing materials consisting of no more than copies of lecture notes, references to textbooks and practice tasks, while those sufficiently adventurous to introduce other media, have been known to send audio cassettes which were records of full lectures as given on campus. He admits that distance education poses problems which do not arise in face-to-face -face teaching and also that those academics who join distance education institutions seem to require some training. He also admits that experienced university teachers have not always shown good results when asked to work in distance teaching institutions. Very often their efforts have not gone beyond their producing materials consisting of no more than copies of lecture notes, references to textbooks and practice tasks, while those sufficiently adventurous to introduce other media have been known to send audio cassettes which were records of full lectures as given on campus. 2. Elton believes that in the training of any kind, trainees have previously passed through a training similar to that which they are now being trained for. That is, officers have at one time been cadets, supervisors have been subordinates, and teachers have been students. Thus, the Trainee teacher knows what being a teacher means, he she has seen teachers in action when he she was a student, and also what being a student means, he she had himself herself been a student one time. 3. For Elton, academics working at higher levels of education need a training course in higher education, and those engaged in distance. Education too need the same course, however, they should take it using distance learning methods. By undergoing a training course using distance learning methodology, the trainee will experience distance learning methods at every stage. Elton emphasizes that the fundamentals of distance learning can be treated through a general treatment of individualized learning and that its special features will emerge for the participants through their own experience. First May 2002 Common Training Program, Reflections To begin with we should admit that most distance teachers today have not been distance learners. And this situation is going to continue for quite some time to come. They may not have any idea about the experiences of distance learners. It is, however, possible that they get informed about such experiences through reading or any other means. Clearly, 
only a few have direct experience and it is this direct experience of being a distance learner elton thinks which the prospective distance teacher requires most by getting this direct experience of distance learning he she will be like the cadet now under training to be an officer or like an operator now training to be a foreman but the present situation we are talking about does not give the opportunity to all distance teachers to personally go through the experience of distance learners to sum up a prospective distance teacher must in the main experience distance learning and while doing so he she also needs to learn about individualized learning to complete his her training to function as a successful distance teacher the courses on the practice of higher education given by surrey university courses are open to practicing teachers and the components which constitute these courses include modules on teaching and learning methods course design assessment communication and media administration and management etc it may be noted that these modules may justifiably be components of staff development program for distance education but the course aims to increase the members knowledge awareness and skills in matters relating to teaching and learning in higher education thus though we admit that the modules should be useful for distance educators the course as a whole as conceived by those who give it is a staff development program for higher education and so it does not meet the special requirements of distance teachers the implication is that we need a different training course for distance teaching 1.6 purposes of training distance educators parameters in this section we shall talk about the views of Maitram 1981 who worked in the division of external studies Riverina College at the time he presented these views and not about any particular case available at the college we are introducing these views mainly to acquaint you with the line of thinking from Australia which is different from the one advanced by the Open University UK both the lines of thinking going on in two different parts of the world some time ago were influential in designing the staff development programs for distance education Maitram thinks that in the context of distance teaching staff development is required to improve the quality of instructional materials used in distance teaching he suggests that a staff development program can be proposed only after the following are considered carefully 1 structural and instructional parameters of designing distance teaching materials and 2 the stages of concern of the faculty members we shall elaborate these factors here 1st June 2001 structural parameters structural parameters which influence the effectiveness of distance teaching as listed by Maitram are times course function what are the aims and objectives of the course times available modes of instruction what are the media available to be put to use to present the course times subject characteristics what pedagogic structure will suit the subject concerned for example it many not be useful to present courses in mathematics the same way as courses in literature times subject location what is the sequential position of the subject part thereof in the whole course times teacher characteristics lecturers differ in their attitudes experience etc and this affects the structures of the course materials times student characteristics age educational level degree of involvement etc times professional assistance layout graphics copyright test design etc make significant contribution to the effectiveness of the course materials it may be noted that all these factors by themselves are not the components of course design lying outside the design itself however they exercise great influence in making the materials effective 1st june 2002 instructional parameters 
The instructional parameters which influence the effectiveness of the materials are Times motivation, student's interest has to be assured and maintained by Means of the subject matter, design, packaging etc. Goal definition, indicates what knowledge and competencies the learner is to demonstrate after he has gone through the course. Times cognitive structuring, the presentation of materials should have logical and psychological relations between the subject components. Times signposting, layout, access devices, activities, etc. help the learner to be on the right track. Times activation, asking students to work on questions and various tasks is helpful. Times feedback, from the tutor to the student and vice versa help build didactic conversation successfully. Times transfer and retention, learning may be said to have been achieved if the learner can retain what he she has learned and apply his her learning to new situations, to achieve this objective adequate number of exercises of differing types should form of the materials. Times assessment and evaluation, the effectiveness of the materials should be evaluated by various means. 1st June 2003 Effectiveness of the parameters, when and how. Basic to this view is Mailchum's belief that workshops, verbal instructions, administrative admonitions, etc., cannot improve the design of course. Materials. Improvements of the kind we are talking about are possible only through improving the individuals, their aptitudes and their experiences. If the developmental stages of the individuals do not match with the orientation training, the program may not succeed in achieving its goals. It is therefore advisable to identify what the level of concern of a particular faculty member is, and then arrange a training program for him her. Accordingly, identifying the levels of concern of the staff. Broadly, the following three levels of concern are possible. They may be understood in terms of statements given against each. 1. Impact concerns. I know certain things which will be more effective. Let me try use them. I would like to see how effective my design is, etc. 2. Task concerns. I have no means to implement my ideas. 3. Self concerns. I am not interested in any changes. I do not know that. Changes are expected. It is true that academics will hardly ever have concerns at only one level. It is also likely, however, that one level dominates over others at a given point of time. Designing the program according to staff needs. The problem of staff development, as seen by Melcham, 1981, is to find a way of matching the need for transmitting essential elements of instructional design with the concerns of faculty members. The ideal solution is to look into the concerns of the individual academic and train him her according to his her needs, but more practical is to identify groups of academics with similar concerns and make them undergo a training program suitable for their level of concern. Mailchum suggests that structural and instructional parameters are linked with the higher level of concern, i.e. impact, concern and task concerns. In other words, talking of the importance of those parameters to the academic whose concerns are at the self-level will have no influence on them. What the academics at the self level of concerns need is awareness or which they need to be approached through informal meetings and be sensitized for what they need to do. 1st June 2004 Stages of Staff Development As a general scheme for staff development, the overall operation may have the following stages. 1. Defining the innovation for which the staff is to be trained. 2. Identifying the concerns of the faculty members in relation to innovation. This may be done with the help of interviews, questionnaires, etc. 3. Organizing the faculty members into different groups, according to their levels of concern. 4. Relating each group with the objective they should achieve, 
the strategy that needs to be used to achieve that objective and what the trainers should focus their activities on. 5. Preparing the blueprint of the training program. 6. Implementing the program. Mailtrump believes that the ultimate aim of staff development in distance education is to implement new concepts and procedures in order to help times the users of the distance education systems to adjust with innovations times the agents of distance education to be more helpful and times the system to be more responsive to the changing needs Mailtrump rightly believes that the program outline given above does not solve all the issues involved in staff development for distance education however he thinks that the outline is an attempt to bridge the gap between the actions required to bring about an improvement in instructional design and the competencies and concerns of essential participants obviously like the OUUK approach Mailtrum's focus too is on the instructional material but the strategies adopted by both to train course writers are different the course team approach of the open university assumes that any sound academic may join the team and learn the job whereas Mailchum's strategy suggests that the personnel to write self-instructional materials should be identified and the training programs be designed according to the needs of the individual members we also know that distance education is much more than instructional materials besides right now we are not aware of any training program that follows the above line of thought propounded by Mailcham, except the workshop orientation programs which are designed and implemented for specific groups of the staff a workshop for audio and video script writers an orientation program for prospective counselors a workshop for course editors etc 1.7 a course on distance education the course introduced in India in 1980 is just one among many which constitute the components of a teacher training program at the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, India. The following themes constitute the course, distance education, times distance education, concept and philosophy, times socio-economic relevance of distance education, times characteristics of self-instructional materials, assignments etc times student support services etc times practicals analysis of self instructional materials assessment of assignments etc the focus of this course is essentially on two way didactic communication though certain themes are considered to be relevant it cannot be considered a full fledged professional course in distance education that is why it has been treated as part of a general training program for the teachers of English language in India. 1.8 Let us sum UP. Let us briefly state what we have presented in the previous sections and see why we made the selection of cases the way we did. In the first place, of the six cases we have discussed four belong to the UK. That is understandable as the pioneering work on open distance education began most visibly with the Open University, UK. Consequently, before anywhere else, it was in Britain that the need for staff development for distance education was felt and attended to. The OUUK developed its philosophy and methodology of training the staff, obviously, somewhere around 1969 when the university started functioning. Jordan Hill College introduced its training course in 1975 and the international extension college in 1977 followed by the course introduced by surrey university in 1980 the complexion intent and philosophy of no two of these are in agreement this too is understandable as the resource institutes had differing perceptions of what they wanted to do and for what purpose the OUUK had its own staff in mind Jordan Hill College had the whole country in its mind, whereas the International Extension College and the Surrey University had the developing countries in their minds when the courses were developed. Secondly, we noticed that the views and or courses mentioned under sections 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22,
1.7 of this unit appeared almost simultaneously in or around 1980. 1981 all three views, i.e. those from Surrey University, through Elton, from Riverina College, through Maycham, and from the Central Institute of English and Foreign Languages, India, through Cool, were presented at the same Symposium on Distance Education Penin, Malaysia, in 1981. What is significant in this coincidence is that, to our best knowledge, it was for the first time that distance education practitioners from three different parts of the world emphatically articulated their concerns regarding the issue of staff development for distance education at an international symposium. When Elton had raised the question of staff development for distance education in a similar symposium in 1979, it was treated as in comprehension, Elton 1981, however, by 1985, the people concerned with distance education had realized that the issue was relevant for the development of distance education. At the 13th World Conference of the International Council for Distance Education held at Melbourne in 1985, this theme was given the status of a special interest group within the program of the conference. But the coincidence ends there, since the three views presented focused on three different issues. Like the other three courses introduced in Britain, touched upon above. These three too did not suggest any explicit steps towards the convergence of views in the field of staff development for distance education. Looked at in this light, though the 70s owed appreciable effort to bring in programs for staff development, the approaches and implementation strategies were amorphous in character, as no two institutions, courses or thinkers seem to show agreement on the essentials. However, it should be admitted that promising beginnings were made, notwithstanding the fact that they were amorphous in character. It was during the early 80s that a convergence of Views in this regard started emerging and it took recognizable shape by 1985. It is during this period that the workers in this field started articulating their concerns in favor of some kind of professional approach to staff development for distance education. At present, as usual, initial articulations, besides being feeble, could not be comprehensive, nor could they be free from controversies. But that is a different theme, and we shall take it up in the next unit. Thank you, subscribe to our channel for more updates, and we will see you with the next chapter.